morning and welcome to Morning Movie News, where Hollywood hasn't quite woken up still from the Oscars. Uh, so it's slim pickings when it comes to movie news headlines. I mean, there are headlines, but I don't want to waste your time or my time covering some of the small ones uh, that uh, the movie news industry is, you know, uh, trying to make do with. Uh, so I, I found, I managed to find three stories for today, and the first one is some pretty pictures. Uh, I actually had these tweeted to me by several BTT viewers, and they are of uh, Scarlet Witch, aka Elizabeth Olsen, who really hasn't gotten the love I think she deserves uh, post her spectacular debut in Avengers Age of Ultron. It's still a lot about Black Widow, which is understandable because Black Widow is so cool, uh, although I just picked up her new comic from uh, Marvel from the team of Mark Wade and Chris Samney, who had such a spectacular run on... Um, on uh, Daredevil recently, uh, but they just kind of, you know, t seem to have taken the Winter Soldier storyline and just applied it to Natasha. And it's like, come on, Natasha deserves her own storyline. She doesn't need to rip off Steve, but uh, that's unfortunately what they did. So the whole first uh, issue was like, uh, I don't know how this turned into a Black Widow review, but as I said, slim pickings today. Uh, but what happened was is that they basically took the whole Captain America escapes from uh, S.H.I.E.L.D. headquarters uh, bit uh, and applied it to Black Widow. Now they came up with some very Black Widow-esque things for her to do, uh, but at the same time, you know, I think that it was a little bit derivative. But anyway, uh, the Scarlet Witch comic is even worse. I don't even read that anymore. I couldn't really stick with it, uh, but I think it's because it, it's um, it's so divided from the character that Joss Whedon created. So maybe that might be plaguing Scarlet Witch a little bit, uh, that, you know, the comic book version differs so wildly from the movie version. Uh, but the movie version looks amazing. I mean, these decals are absolutely spectacular. Uh, my favorite is this uh, first one that I've uh, put up here uh, because I just think she looks, she does look like a little bit like she came from the comics. Like, it's a very good real-world interpretation of the comics. You know, it's a little bit like what they tried to do uh, with the Ultimates line here, uh, and they're even more successful than the Ultimates line was reimagining Scarlet Witch. And also, I have to say, the way that they've, um, you know, somewhat photoshopped Elizabeth Olsen here and the way they've done her fingers, she actually looks like um, a Kubert drawing, which is pretty neat. Uh, I believe, I think Adam Kubert, if I had to pick. Uh, there's two Kubert brothers, Andy and Adam. Uh, they are the sons of Joe Kubert, and they're both spectacular artists who don't work that much, because I guess they don't need to. Their page rates must be insane. If you don't know what a page rate is, in the comic book world, that's how you get paid. You have a page rate. Uh, and they, they differ for artists and writers, but and also by publisher. Um, needless to say, the, the big two have the best page rates. But anyway, uh, so she looks, looks absolutely spectacular. I love the use of magic. That's very cool. <clears throat> Again, very much like the comics with the cool hand gestures. And I would really love to see her pop up in the Doctor Strange movie. Uh, it doesn't look like it's going to happen unless it's a very well-guarded secret. Uh, but this is like the kind of direction I'd like to see. I'm more interested in the magic direction for the uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe than I am this uh, space cosmic direction. Uh, so, But we'll see. Uh, so it looks fantastic. And then you have another image here. Uh, this one's also cool. Not quite as cool. This one looks closer to fan art. The first one just looks so good and professional. And some fan art, to be fair, is spectacular. Uh, but this one seems like in the middle ground of both. Uh, but still, I like the use of powers. We don't really... We, ha we don't have any flying female characters uh, yet. Now we do. I hope she flies a lot in the movie, or at least enough to make her, you know, categorize as a flying character. She hovered, really, at the end of Age of Ultron. Uh, but she looks super cool there. I hope to see some really neat new moves that she's developed. Some of the coolest uh, uh, gifs to come out of uh, uh, Age of Ultron were... Uh, Scarlet Witch, you know, doing her, uh, her her mystical whammy, so that was really cool. But she looks great, and I think that the the costume is a very is a very good choice, and also is very true to the original comics character. Uh, and then this one, this one's a little cheesy, uh, but I can under I can understand its need for the decal to look like this because they want it to be able to be easily separated and you know and easy to be made as a transparent. So that's fine, I'll forgive it. But it's actually my least favorite 
of the three. Uh, but Elizabeth Olsen, really great uh, job with this character, and I don't understand why she hasn't quite caught it in popularity. It's the same uh, with Black Widow. Uh, but, you know, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Black Widow didn't quite catch on that much after the first uh, Avengers and the first, uh, you know, Iron Man 2, her first appearance. Uh, but things, I think, really picked up for her uh, with, of course, uh, you know, Winter Soldier and, uh, you know, I think to some degree in the Avengers movie. Yeah, but I think there she benefited from being the only female character. But now there's multiple female characters. They're going to have to all work a little bit harder. But very, very cool. All right, so that's the first story of the day. The second story is another story that a lot of people are interested in, and this is a little bit TV-like. It's hard to try and differentiate between TV and movies. The line becomes continually blurred. But uh, there was a big <clears throat> announcement yesterday that Big Hero 6 is getting a television show on the Disney Channel in 2017. And why is this count as movie news? Well, not only is a movie being turned into a TV show, but this speaks to a big change that's happening actually in the entertainment industry and that DreamWorks Animation talked about as well. Uh, the other day, on, on, on a, uh, Monday, or uh, no, Tuesday, actually, Tuesday, uh, and so I, w I was going to cover that story anyway, but now I can bundle them together in a great animation and TV, uh, you know, overall story. So what's going on is that uh, Disney is bringing two of their big movies to the small screen in 2017, Tangled and Big Hero 6. And Big Hero 6 is going to be from one of the creators of Kim Possible. So I think that's a, a good match of uh, material, actually, Kim Possible and Big Hero 6. And it will continue the adventures of uh, Hero and Baymax, but also their team, the, the Big Hero 6. Uh, so I think that could be pretty good. I think that the, Disney has a good track record turning their movies in t uh, into TV shows. Uh, but, you know, I think Tangled could also be really big as well. I think the cast on Big Hero 6 is so big that Tangled might have an advantage there. But why is Disney doing this? Why not make Big Hero 6 2 or Tangled 2, which there's a lot of demand for? Well, Jeffrey Katzenberg shed some light on that in a recent uh, meeting with investors or shareholders uh, talking about the future of DreamWorks Animation. And he had some interesting things to say about the movie business, saying that there's a restructuring going on internally that's about halfway done. You might recall that a number of people had to leave the company because they were having such a problem at the box office, and they're also going to make less movies a year. They had ramped up production to three movies a year, found out that they were cannibalizing their own market and their own material, and so they're going to make less movies and just try to make them better quality. Although, uh, you know, Kung Fu Panda 3, I believe, was a, was a solid success for them. But they want to get back to the days when they were rocking the box office and winning Oscars, which is understandable. And I would say that I miss their more ambitious days, like The Road to El Dorado, um, uh, Prince of Egypt, when they were making films. Uh, even Sinbad. Is, I really like Sinbad. That's one of the I, a, a really good DreamWorks animation animated film. I feel now they're a little bit, you know, gimmicky, and I would like to see them try to return to the artistic aspects of the pla of the art form of the medium because they did them so well. But he went on to say, you know, where we're really focusing a lot of our efforts television because TV is a huge money maker for us. In fact, it's what's currently driving our business model. What? Well, here's the thing. Streaming has been a game changer for the animation field because there's a huge demand for kids and family content. Now, on the sad, on a sad note, I think it's because maybe many people just want to park kids in front of it, right? They're like, I want the streaming. I'm already paying a flat rate for the streaming, so I want them to provide me with kids fare, and then I can just entertain my kids that way. Uh, so, you know, it's a, it's a positive and a negative, but it's interesting. It might even be viewed as a negative by many of you for what it's going to do to the animation industry, because now that's where the money is. And of course, money drives all business decisions, as it should, because businesses are supposed to make money. So though, uh, it's so it seems that now a movie launches a potential franchise that needs to have a TV component. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised, you know, if the Big Hero 6 does well, maybe Disney will try and set up their, uh, you know, um, animated Marvel properties even more so than they do now. But they have a, they are not, they're good with bringing the animated movies to animation, but they have a lousy track record when it comes to the Marvel properties uh, proper. Uh, Big Hero 6 is kind of like an in-betweener. But I was curious, what do you think of that? And what do you think of this change of focus for animation, the animation industries, uh, you know, studios? They want to go and they want to... Um, create stuff for streaming because that's where the money is and that's going to change a real that's going to really change priorities in the business so i thought that was a fascinating development and uh, i think it's a good thing for us to know when we look uh, towards the animation industry going forward and try to understand why certain decisions are being made all right so let's go into the third story of the day talk about 
things being influenced and changes in the industry. Chris Rock made a very big statement when he hosted the Oscars, and it seems that he has been heard. However, the question is, just because you've heard something doesn't mean you make the right you have the right reaction, right? So there's a big story in The Hollywood Reporter about J.J. Abrams and how he is leading the charge for diversity. Hilarious! J.J. Abrams is leading the charge for diversity. But on one hand, you know, you have to point out that he did a, did a very nice job with Star Wars. So I think, you know, he's got that going for him. But anyway, he had a personal interview talking about how he was helping diversity and, you know, how that was like his new thing. But then also there was another article talking about uh, what pl what changes that he was getting made in the industry. So this is the, the sentence that uh, I decided to highlight because <coughs> it's very interesting. So it says, now the film industry is following suit. J.J. Abrams' production company, Bad Robot, has teamed with its agency, CAA, and studio partners to require that women, and I think it's interesting that a production company has an agency, uh, so it shows you how the industry works, but to require that women and people of color are submitted for writing, directing, and acting jobs, now this is the kicker, in proportion to their representation in the U.S. population. I think that is a really bad way to go. I think that this is when things start to go to hell and when people get upset and uh, when they start to say that uh, diversity is a bad thing. Because this is sounding a lot like affirmative action to me. And affirmative action, I think, you know, there was a time and place for it. And I think it is important to make sure you have a diverse pool of candidates. But I guess once you start adding quotas to the mix uh, and limits, uh, you know, I think that that's where you start to get into trouble. So allow me to explain. And then we're going to go into the viewer question, which actually is tied into this as well. So my problem is, is that if you're going to buy numbers and you're like, well, you know, 50% of the population in the United States is women. I'm just taking that off the top of my head, but I assume that's close to correct. So 50% of the applicants for this job need to be women. So, but what that means is that you're going to have women, maybe there are only so many qualified candidates, right? Because not a lot of women at this point have chosen to go into the industry. I mean, that's just the truth. Kathleen Kennedy has commented on that, right? So it's like, okay, well, they're really only like, let's say there are 100 applicants for a job, right? Just to make it easy. So they're only like maybe, let's be generous, 30 qualified women for the position. But uh, I need 50. So I'm going to add another 20 subpar candidates just to meet my quota numbers, right? I mean, like, that's not what they should be looking at. And if they want to change, you know, maybe they should be looking at recruiting for film schools and getting people interested. I mean, you can't just draft people into the profession because you need them to be there as a token. I mean, I don't think that's a good idea either. And I also don't think we want people going, hey, there's, there's a big demand all of a sudden for a certain ethnicities in Hollywood and they have a lack of them because they weren't hiring any of them. So I'm going to run in there and get all the work, but I don't really know what I'm doing. So I'm going to just ruin the reputation of that ethnicity when it comes to getting the job well done. That's what I fear happening. Right? I mean, you want to you want to just encourage people of all different backgrounds and uh, genders and ethnicities to want to get into the entertainment business, and then you take them as they develop and as they graduate to a level of quality and competency. Right? I mean, that's what, and I'm talking about white dudes in that mix too. Right? So I just, and also I think that so let's let's get on to the second to the viewer question, and then we'll just discuss this as a whole. Right? So the viewer question comes from Mr. Cash eight eight. Eight, eight. And Mr. Cash was very nice about this, but, you know, very, really adamant in wanting this question to get answered. But perfect timing, because it fits into the other rest of the coverage of the day. So Mr. Cash 88 says, Grace, tons of emojis. I have a question. So the day after the Oscars, I went, when I went to school, I really wanted to talk about the awards with someone and share my mostly negative opinions about it. And when it was time to talk about the director category, and I said that I really wanted George Miller to win, no one listened to what I had to say and said that Inaritu 100% deserved the award and that they were proud of a fellow Mexican winning. By the way, I am from Mexico. And by the way, hey, most of them didn't even see any of the nominees. So this is my question. If not even the general audience is able to see movies like Fury Road and The Dark Knight as works of art, will the Academy ever do it? Are people so brainwashed with these Oscar bait movies? Please answer my question. Well, I have to tell you, Mr. Cash 88, well, first of all, great question, by the way, and I loved the way you explained the whole situation and gave us a whole picture of what happened. That was really nice. But I don't think this is the Oscar bait talking. I think this is the, the nationality talking and that your fellow students really just wanted a Mexican to win. And I can understand that, but they have to realize that that same Mexican 
won last year, right? And what about all the other Mexicans? All the awards are going to just one Mexican. What about Jay Bayona? What about Guillermo del Toro? And oh, by the way, Alfonso Cuaron, another Mexican, he just won a few years ago for Gravity. So it's not like Mexicans are not well represented when it comes to the Oscars, but this is purely patriotism. And there's nothing wrong with patriotism, <coughs> except when it starts to make you th see things not clearly. So that's why I wanted to bring in this question, because I also feel that if you start having like teams, then you're no longer caring what's best for the property, but you're caring about just getting one of your guys in there, right? Like, like look at your friends, Mr. Cash 88. They weren't concerned with the best person getting the Oscar, they, cause, and they can't have been because they didn't see the movies, right? So that's how we know that they're not just going on the material. Their concern was that a Mexican get it. Uh, and I feel that that, you know, nobody wants that kind of thinking to take over uh, for any uh, national nationality, any demographic, right? I mean, you want the best person to win the job. I'm a big believer in a meritocracy, which means you live or die by the quality of your work. Uh, <coughs> so I have a big problem with anything that tries to go uh, for a different set of standards, right? I mean, and also, I have to say, that's what everybody's saying who is not being represented. They're like, I just want my work to be recognized. I just want a chance to prove myself. Nobody wants to be a token. Why not? Allow me to explain. Well, first of all, if you're a token, you usually are not actually part of the team. You're just supposed to be there, but nobody really thinks you're part of the team anyway, so it's bad. But then also, if you are, let's say, Let's say you're a Mexican filmmaker, right? And uh, Inaritu has won two times in a row. <clears throat> or let's say you're let's say you're an actual Mexican filmmaker. Let's say you're J. A. Bayona, and you're out there making great movies, right? Well, this wasn't his. He didn't make any good movies this year. But let's take like The Impossible, for instance, right? So you're like, holy crap! I'm not winning. You know, even though they want to give, let's say, let's say the Academy wants to give Oscars to Mexicans. I can't get one because I don't play the political game as well as Inaritu. Inaritu is a very good campaigner. So Inaritu is getting the Oscar because he's put himself out there and, you know, named himself the Mexican candidate. But I'm also Mexican. Why aren't I being considered for the Oscar? So I think it creates a new set of rules where maybe the best filmmaker doesn't excel, right? That's where you start rewarding the person who is best at maneuvering politically. So then you might end up with like, so let's say, go back to J.J. Abrams and Bad Robot and CAA and whoever they're hiring. Let's say they want to make a movie and they're like, hmm, we really should get a, a black writer for this, right? So they go and they're like, well, we're not going to look for the best writer and just be open to that writer maybe being black. We're just going to look for a black writer. But then a black writer comes along and he's like, I'm a, and he's a great writer, right? And they go, but wait a minute, are you black enough? Are you really going to represent what we want in terms of a black writer in the statement we're trying to make? You might be good, but this other black writer, his script isn't as good, but he has a better narrative for being black. So when we hire him and we put him on in all the articles and we say, oh, look at our black writer, he's going to play better with, with the publicity. That's horrible. That's what you open the door to when you have this kind of thinking. I think at the end of the day, the, the, what Hollywood should do is just say, I just want to make great stories, right? And then I think if you're going to have any quotas that you try and meet, it might be, you know, I don't think there should be any quota. I think you should look at your, if you're a studio, you should look at your slate of movies and you go, is the whole population or movie going population, because I'm not making movies for people who don't go to the movies, but a lot of people go to the movies, so this is a good rule of thumb. Is everybody represented? And I don't want to make just this is my black movie, this is my women's movie, this is my uh, this is my Mexican movie. No, you don't want to do that. You know, you, you and I said Mexican because we've been talking Mexicans. Uh, this is a delicate conversation, obviously. But you want to have a movie like The Martian, where it was for everybody. The Martian was a great example of a very diverse film that where everybody was included. Sure, the lead was a white guy, but one step at a time. Uh, and sure, the director was a white guy, and the writer was a white guy, but uh, it made, at least in the cast, it made progress. <clears throat> so that's what I think should be the goal, to just make movies that represent the world as it is. And sure, you'd occasionally have, okay, this is a, a movie that's largely black. Okay, this is a movie that's largely about women. Okay, this is a movie that's largely about uh, the Latino experience, whatever. But I think that overall, you should just be trying to make good movies and just try and cast different people. Like Asi Sansari had a really good uh, thing about Indians on TV, one of the episodes of his uh, show Master of None on Netflix. And they were really good, just saying like, hey, why can't this guy be Indian if I did, had the best audition?
And I think that's a really good, that's a really good way to think about it. Just who had the best audition? Audition everybody. And I'm talking auditioning, not just for roles, but for the role of director, for writer. Get everybody's reel in there. Talk to everybody about their vision for the film and hire the best person for the job. That's what, that should be like on a pillow in everybody's office or like a plate on their desk that says, just hire the best person for the job and consider everybody. All right, that's, okay, thank you for thinking that out with me. I'm happy with that conclusion. How do you feel about it? Be sure to write your thoughts down below. Thank you everybody for tuning in. Please write down below what you think of today's top three stories and that viewer question for Mr. Cash 88 uh, And then also, of course, anything that you would like to see covered tomorrow and any stories that you might have. Thanks for watching. Bye. Thank you.